We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Okay, good afternoon to all. Um, I'm Deborah Vassallo from the Maltese Safer Internet Center and together with David Wright from the UK Safer Internet Center and Evan Evangelia Daskalaki from the Greek Safer Internet Center, all part of the Unsafe Network, we would like to welcome you uh, to our workshop called Mind the Gen Gender Gap or Mend the Gender Gap. Uh, throughout the years, plenty of research and evidence has suggested that women and girls are disproportionately victims of abuse online. Women and girls who experience online abuse, but also those who witness it online, may feel powerless and find difficulty in expressing themselves because of the fear of being attacked. Violence against women and girls online is a human rights violation and a universal issue which requires collaboration between all states in order to ensure a safe digital space for women and girls. This will be discussed today in our workshop with our panelists who are both here and also in Katowice and also online. And I would like to start by introducing uh, our first panelist, who's um, Maria Spiraki, who is the Greek member of the European Parliament since 2014, and she has been the ambassador for Safe Internet and constantly supports uh, the Greek Safer Internet Center. Uh, Maria, uh, the, fl the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to all of you from Brussels. First and foremost, I would like to, to thank you very much for the invitation to participate in the Internet Governance Forum 2021 as a keynote speaker upon the invitation by the Greek Safer Internet Center and the Greek Department of the Foundation for Research and Technology. Once again, I would like to thank uh, co the colleagues for, for this invite. It's a great honor for me Unfortunately, due to parliamentary obligation here in Brussels, I am unable to physically attend it, uh, your meeting uh, in, in Katowice, but I welcome the contact of proceedings of the action mind, the, the gender gap of or mend the gender gap. It is a remarkable initiative that addresses the issue of gender imbalance online and cyber violence. To start with, I would like to point out that dismantling the obstacles for women in the digital world and of course, in general, necessitates creating a level playing field with men. There is still a lot to be done in terms of education, first of all, of young girls, and ensuring that girls are not discouraged, neither from careers in business and tech, nor from discriminatory practices and blasphemies. Entrepreneurial learning for girls and women should be enforced through a strategic framework of national and European policies. The Commission, the European Commission study, Women in the Digital Age, confirms, first of all, the existing threat that only 24 out of, ev of every 1,000 female graduates having an ICT-related subject, of which only six go on to work in the digital sector. Girls, women are a minority in the digital sector. The studies findings show also a, a decrease in this number when compared to 2011. The study also found that if more women were to enter the digital jobs market, it could create an annual 16 billion euros GDP boost for the European economy. In view of the findings from the study, the European Commission outlined the strategy to increase women's participation in the digital sector in order to close the loop focusing on three aspects, challenging digital gender stereotypes, promoting digital skills and education, advocating for more women entrepreneurs. Apart from the professional aspects, which I think is very important, the problem of cyber violence against women is also an alarming issue, but we must be effectively dealt with. 
the increasing sets of the internet, the rapid spread of mobile information, the widespread use of social media has led to the image of cyber violence against women and girls as a growing global problem with potentially significant economic and societal consequences. Research by the World Health Organization shows that one in three, one in three women will have experienced a form of violence in her lifetime. And despite the relatively new and growing phenomenon of internet connectivity, it is estimated that one in 10 women have already experienced a form of cyber violence since the age of 15. Furthermore, a 2021 study from the European Parliament indicated that four to seven percent of women in the EU in 27 member states have experienced cyber harassment during the past 12 months, during the period of lockdown and pandemic, while between one to three percent have experienced cyber stalking. The rages in the estimates ref reflect the underlying uncertainty arising from the lack of robust and recent cross-country data available on the phenomenon. We need data to, to have a, a chapter of the phenomenon and we need also credible data. It appears nevertheless that the younger age groups face the, the greatest risk and that the prevalence of the phenomenon has risen with greater internet and social media use it is for the youngest. The prevalence of gender-based cyber violence is likely to continue to rise in the coming years, especially among the younger people. Cyber violence has a direct impact on victims, first and foremost in terms of the mental health, reflected in, in an increased uh, incident of depression and, uh, and accident disorders. A number of social and economic impacts can also be identified like withdrawal from, from the public debate, cost incurred from for seeking legal and health care assistance, labor market impacts in terms of lower presence at work, risks of job loss or lower productivity, and reduced quality of life due to poor mental health itself. These sets of impacts generate costs affecting victims as well as society. Some impacts are tangible and they can translate into economic costs, while others are intangible and cannot be monetized despite being of, mo of major relevance. Some of the cost of gender-based cyber violence were quantified candid by, by means in economic assessment. These costs included uh, healthcare costs, legal costs, labor market costs, and costs associated with a reduced quality of life. The economic assessment estimates the overall cost of cyber harassment and cyber stackling at between 49 to 89 billion euros. The largest cost category was the monetized value of the loss in terms of quality of life, which accounted for more than half of the overall cost. It is about 60% for cyber harassment and about 50% for cyber stackling. Labor market impacts were also found to be substantial, together accounting for approximately 30% for cyber harassment and 35% for cyber stackling. The higher cost for the latter, owing to lower rival force participation, as we have already mentioned. Healthcare costs and legal costs, while contributing less to overall cost, were nonetheless substantial. Cyber violence against humans occurs in various online communication. We all know social media, web content, discussion sites, dating websites, comment sections, gaming, chat rooms, etc. It can make different forms. It can make hate speech, harassment, online stackling, trafficking and sexual exploitation, content sharing without consent, and hacking, identity theft, doxing, which is searching and publishing private information on the internet, and of course, cyberbullying during the period that the girls are at school. Such value and behaviors can, can commit by different types of perpetrators. They may be relatives or friends friends of the victim. Ex or, are, or current intimate partners using digital devices to track and control their victims, the life of their victims, classmates, co-workers, or anonymous users, or online criminals, or hackers. Perpetrators may have a political or religious agenda, as in the case of group opposing women's rights or political groups targeting women's participation in the public debate, in the public life, maybe in politics or in the university or other sectors. They may act alone or as a group, even without consulting each other. 
to add the final flare of complexity of the environment that we are working upon, the online environment is constantly on the move and new forms of the phenomenon are emerging. The full extent of cyber violence against women will only be, will only be revealed once the EU and the member states I like to unite their efforts in producing more comprehensive, holistic and detailed data. According to my opinion, this is the key. Both the EU and the member states should in particular strive to produce more statistics on the prevalence and forms of cyber violence, as well as on the effectiveness of our intervention, I mean in the intervention coming from, from the legal perspective, from the legal framework. A European recommendation should address the topic to foster the uniformity and comparability of data gathering by member states. Having identified a wide range of gaps in the existing EU actions and legislation and the negative impacts on women and girls individually, socially and economically on account of gender-based cyber violence, I strongly believe that we need to act and intervene at the EU level. The lack of harmonizing legal definitions, the lack of awareness raising, which is very important, and I think that we have to start from school, the underreporting, the need for more research and data and the parameters needs to address in order to achieve a greater momentum by the EU are very important. Bearing in mind that it is also a cross-border issue. It's not an issue which is affecting regions and member states. It is a cross-border issue and by the end of the day, it is an EU issue we have to tackle. At the national levels, several member states have passed legislation specifically target cyber violence against women in particular on non-consensual image sharing and sexual harassment online. For instance, and I would like to give you some examples, France, Germany, Malta, Ireland, Italy and Slovenia have made the act of sharing images without consent illegal and punishable. Moreover, France has broadened the scope, the definition of online harassment to render group-based coordinated online harassment punishable. Nevertheless, there are still a lot to be done in order to to the member states to ensure that their laws are appropriate for the digital age and to reflect the use of technologies for abuse, crimes and exploitation of women. Of course, apart from national good practices, it is of utmost importance to proceed to regulate this issue at European level. The European Commission is to propose a general directive on violence against women containing definition of the different types of, of violence, including the definition of cyber violence, which is very important to have. A revision of the Victims' Rights Directive should be considered to account for the specific nature of gender-based violence and to include specific provisions on the protection and support to victims of gender-based violence online. Furthermore, online trafficking in women and girls should be mainstreamed in the Anti-Trafficking Directive. What is more as recommended by the European Advisory Committee on Equal Opportunities for Women and Men in the opinion on competing online violence against women that brought to the European Parliament last, not last, the, the April of 2020, is that the European Commission is to promote cooperation between member states, internet intermediaries and NGOs working on the issue, such as peer learning events and public conference, which is the raising awareness aspect, which is, according to my opinion, of, of paramount importance. It is also more important to invite the member states to develop a harmonized and regularly update directory of support services, helplines and reporting mechanism available in individual cases of cyber violence against women. These should be available on a singular platform, which should also contain information on the support available for other forms of violence against women, and as we user-friendly and accessible as possible could be, this kind of platform will facilitate the victims. In this regard, I would like to inform you, and I would like to underline, that we will vote next, year, next week in Strasbourg, we will have a plenary in Strasbourg, a report on combating gender-based violence in cyberspace. So your meeting is very timely in this regard, and uh, with this report, we, can on the, we call on the European Commission to strengthen its upcoming legislative proposal on gender-based violence by expanding it to cover gender-based crimes committed online or with the help of digital tools, and by increasing support to victims and promoting more research on the topic. Reaching to conclusion, I would like to remind us these times are changing. Access to the internet is fast becoming necessity for economic well-being. It, it is increasingly viewed as a fundamental human right. Therefore, it is crucial to ensure that this digital public space is a safe and empowering place for everyone, 
including women and girls. As the world experiences a shift towards digital, we must not allow perpetrators of violence against women and girls to get away by moving their acts online. There is no real dilemma here. The choice is obvious. We must proceed with regulating the issue at EU level. We must also mend the gender gap. Thank you very much for your attention. And once again, thank you very much for the invite. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Spiraki, for your uh, intervention. Um, and do you, I would like to uh, see if there are any questions from from the um, guests that we have here, because um, Ms. Spiraki won't be with us for all the session, so due to parliamentary commitments. Yes. Um, uh, sorry, the quality of sound is... is yes, uh, we'll get the mic. I'm low. sorry. Uh, Ms. Piraki, thank you very much um, uh, indeed uh, for your intervention. I would like to ask you, you mentioned uh, something about the platform which is going to be created uh, in order to help uh, tackle violence, gender-based violence. This is something that is going to be discussed uh, uh, next week or in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you. This kind of platform will be established after uh, the procedures of the, of the directive and the regulation we are working upon, but it's not the case for, for next week. Next week we will vote, uh, as I have already mentioned, on the, on the uh, allow me to say, a report concerning the, the cyber violence as, as a kind of crime. And this is the very first step. Just uh, let me explain that uh, maybe sometimes the, the legislative tools are in, in a kind of delay comparing with, the, with the, the illegal action that is taking place in the Internet. And we have to take it into account and I would like kindly to ask you to support us in order to, to speed up with our legislative proposals and also to, 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 to put some further pressure to the Commission and to the Member State to proceed with the, legal, the proper legal instruments and to proceed also with the implementation of the ideas that we need to tackle this phenomenon. Okay, thank you. Another question? Thank you. Uh, gosh, I hope this doesn't take long. Thank you. Um, it was um, good to hear your address, um, honorable member of parliament. I'm just, I mean, we have learned, um, my name is Nash Longo, I'm from Namibia. Um, we have learned from the EU and your work already with the, in, in ensuring that GDPR gets in place, and now you already. Um, on this and, and getting all your member um, nations to be, you know, to, to, to make sure that the protection of women on, on, online um, becomes part of the Commission's work. I mean, just how do you do it? What strategies do you have that, um, you know, f for instance, for the African Commission could, could follow and make sure that they, pr you know, they fasten the process just like you did um, immediately? I think. I'm sorry, I'm also not in government or government officials to immediately um, take the message home, but I just really want to know um, your, your strategies and how you make sure that all your uh, countries, uh, member countries, um, enact everything so quickly. Thank you. I want to say that it is very important to lead by example, and the European Union is leading by example in this regard, trying to create a new and uh, very proactive uh, uh, legislative framework. It's not easy, as we all agree upon this, and it's not also easy to export such kind of legal tools in order to to, to facilitate other countries, uh, uh, other countries that are, are not are not members of the of the European Union but uh, but let me give you some examples first of all we are trying to to proceed with gender equality in the digital era by supporting and empowering young girls and women to to, to, to take part in the, in the digital era and to take their their seats in in the new situation in the new century in this regard I think one of the main uh, issues that we have to to work upon 
is how could you increase the participation of young girls in, in digital studies and how can you, can you also increase the participation of young girls as entrepreneurs in the digital era. The second issue we are, we are trying to go ahead is the, the issue of uh, the legislative proposal on the cyber violence, I have already mentioned it. And the third, I think that it is also important, the, the joint platform that we are trying to, we are going to establish by the end of, uh, of the first semester of 2022. It is a platform that uh, it will uh, gather the, the, the data coming from, from different member states. And it is also a platform that it will facilitate member states to provide assistance. Uh, let me explain to you what the key issue, and I think that it is important for the, for Africa as well. It is the way that we we cover the, we cover the, the relevant data. We need re reliable data. We need data that are coming from different member states, and we need a, a hub, a point, a platform where we can cover the data and work upon this. So I think maybe allow me to, to give a, a kind of a very small piece of advice, the, the first step is starting gathering data and starting creating small platforms in terms of regions or in, in, in countries in Africa, and then try to create something that it, it will be something that it is a Pan-African way of, of proceeding to this, to this effort. Um, hello, can you okay, hear thank me? Thank you. Um, can you hear me? We have another question. Uh, yes. Um, Sorry, Deborah, can you hear me? Yes, Evangelia, we have a question from the online guests. Okay, then I will wait because we also have comments and questions uh, online. Yes, ah, is there on site somebody who has a question? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. I will wait. Thank you very much for your interve intervention. My name is Ana Maria Rodriguez and I work for the World Wide Web Foundation. We work on online gender based violence and my question is what do you think is the role of the big platforms such as Facebook, TikTok, Instagram um, and how do we make them accountable and join us in the fight against online gender based violence? Thank you. Thank you for the question. It is very important to say that uh, in this aspect we are lucky behind because uh, we are based our regulation in a voluntary way of, uh, of tackling the, the issue of gender violence uh, when it comes to the platforms. So we need more support and more engagement. And in a way, we need a global agreement when it comes to the platform that will provide to us the safety that we need. So we are lacking behind in this regard. We are working upon on this with, uh, with voluntary, on a voluntary basis with the platforms, but it's not the case. I think now we need more. Okay. Thank uh, you. So, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to place a question, or maybe later, because we also have uh, the industry in the panelists. So, it's a great question, but we can wait for this question. And it goes like that: What are the tools set in place to combat gender-based violence online at the global phase? I think we have to wait for the other panelists also to, um, to give their speak because we have also the industry here with us and we have uh, so many panelists who would like to, uh, to say some things about that. So I, I think uh, uh, we can wait for that question. And we also have a comment. This session is very timely. I'm currently training female journalists and human rights defender on digital safety and their experiences online are heart heartbreaking. Most of them do not know what to do. They need for awareness creation, especially here in Kenya. And now more than ever um, that we are having elections next year. So thank you very much for your comments. I think we can hear now the, uh, the other panelists too. Thank you, Maria Afiraki for being here with us and um, for all the efforts you put about uh, internet safety. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invite once again. Um, Thank you. I think we have one last question from. Oh. Uh, thank you. So my question uh, is again related to the the role that EU plays, uh, especially in addressing the gender-based violence and the internet. And it's really related on how resources have been allocated, because even though 
for example, EU has been supporting most of women's rights organizations, but we have not seen resources being channeled to women's rights organizations when it comes to their access to, uh, to internet, but also how they build the digital literacy and how do they protect themselves. So we have a trend where the resources are being channeled to the perpetuators, to you know, the owner of the system, the big tech, to the men, and not those who, for example, are the most impacted. And because of that, none of us, for example, who are working in women's rights organizations or a feminist group doesn't have, are not even in the space to discuss, to share, and shape how internet should be governed. So don't you think that EU particularly uh, should mainstream the resources, especially the aid, to ensure that the, res uh, the recipients of those resources are also uh, women who can use those uh, resources to uh, uh, fight and to be educated about uh, internet and violence. Thank you. Allow me to explain that uh, we are working with taxpayers' money and we're having a large responsibility when it comes to the way that we are allocating the resources. In this regard, NGOs are uh, significant stakeholders uh, in order to tackle uh, gender violence in, in, the, in the in the web and in the internet, but it's not the case. The case is that we need transparency, uh, we need coordination, and of course, we need uh, uh, to increase the participation of the NGO in order to increase the, the, the digital literacy and in order to, to proceed with, with solutions that are uh, that are tailor-made in, in, in any case, uh, different solutions within the EU, different solutions in Africa, different solutions in Asia. Uh, that's all I would like to say, because you, you can understand that the European budget is not something that it is in the hands of the, of the Commission, or it is something that it is sharing competence with the Parliament. It is the taxpayers' money, and we have to be very, very careful about it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Piraki, for your intervention and for the questions that we have. And I will go on by introducing our next panelist, who's uh, David Wright. Um, David is the director of the UK Safer Internet Center at Southwest Grid for Learning, which is the national awareness center and also part of the European Safe in Safe Network. David has worked extensively on online safety for 20 years with children, schools, and wider agencies. He advises a number of governments, organizations, and industry partners on online safety strategy and policy, and has recently been appointed as an expert child online protection advisor to the UNITU. David has presented at conferences nationally and internationally. He's a member of UKCIS, as well as the Twitter Trust and Safety Council, and he has recently been invited to be a member of the World Economic Forum, Forum's Global Coalition of Digital Safety. David has led pioneering work, such as the development of multi-award winning resources, as well as the establishment of the helpline for victims of revenge porn. With the Plymouth University has published a number of groundbreaking research reports. David, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, here and um, also, if we can have the slides on, that would be great. Uh, also, I think we've, we've, we're joined by a number of people from across the world as well. So, good morning, good afternoon, or indeed good evening from where everyone uh, joins us from. So, um, it, it's it's amazing to be here um, uh, as part of what is the InSafe Network. But my my contribution um, here is particularly uh, to do with um, the, as you can see here, the uh, the Revenge Porn Helpline. Um, and so one, one of our roles uh, is, uh, as the, the charity SWGFL, is that we operate um, the, the Revenge Porn Helpline um, in the UK and have done since 2015. Um, but we are also uh, a partner in, uh, as, as, uh, as Deborah said, as the, the UK Safe Internet Centre and have been for, for, for 10 years uh, and, and a very proud member of InStafe, hence we are, we are here. Um, and also you can see behind Evangelia there, uh, a small subliminal advert around Safe Internet Day, which is um, on February the 8th uh, next year. Um, we'll, I'm sure we'll come back to that. So m my contribution uh, quickly here is, is, as I say, is around um, uh, our experience uh, over the last six years as operating the Revenge Porn Helpline. Now, the first thing I'm going to say here is that the title 
is a terrible one. Um, uh, and, and so one that we actually do uh, actively dislike. Um, uh, it, it is all around, uh, we support victims essentially of non-consensual intimate image abuse, but uh, that is a mouthful. Uh, and, and we do retain this title because that's how people typically find us and the support that the team offers to victims. Uh, and, and certainly at those moments of need, um, there is usually a lot of distress and a lot of emotion. So uh, having it as frictionless in terms of the ability for victims to find us is, is a really important one. Uh, also here too, uh, we can see stopncii.org. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about that. Uh, I'll, I'll mention it towards the end, but um, it's something that Karuna is going to talk about from Meta. Um, I anticipate a little bit later on, but um, certainly Stop NCII may well answer one of the questions as well that was uh, that, that was posed um, uh, a little earlier on in terms of tools that, uh, that we, uh, in this particular case, in partnership with, with Meta, have created to help prevent um, both uploading of not of, of intimate images uh, as well as the threat to, uh, to to upload intimate images as well. But like I say, I'm sure. Karuna, who's uh, one of the panelists, is going to uh, is going to share talk a lot about that a little bit later on. So, what uh, does the helpline do, um, and and who do we help? So, like I say, on the left hand side there of the screen, you can see who who we support. So, we specifically in this case support adults, um, and it was great to to hear from Maria in terms of which countries, for example, have um, legislation that covers and makes it an offence to post someone's intimate images without consent. Uh, in the UK, that was introduced in 2015, uh, and that's why we saw the, the genesis uh, of this particular helpline. Um, and so at the same time as the law coming into force, um, that uh, we were able to support people and to support uh, victims as well. More recently, in, uh, in May last year, we also saw the additions in the UK of making it an offence to threaten to post someone's intimate images uh, without consent. Uh, and that can, in our experience and from those that we support, can be as distressing, um, indeed, as actually having your images uh, shared uh, online. More recently as well, um, sextortion. Uh, so those who are victims, perhaps a bit more of, of organised crime. Um, uh, and we've so very much seen a, a rise of that, and I'll come back to that um, in a moment. You can see on the right-hand side there the sorts of instances that, um, that, that we deal with. Uh, and we do see um, the... Uh, that perhaps sharing uh, sharing of images um, is is clearly associated, or is often associated uh, with with par partners or indeed uh, for former partners. Uh, more recently, like I said, um, uh, extortion uh, has, has very much come into to fore, where people have been victims of perhaps of phishing or, or has been um, uh, uh, attacks or been being victimised. Uh, online, we have seen as well uh, a, a degree of uh, domestic being involved within domestic uh, abuse situations uh, too, and at the bottom there, so the uh, the inclusion and the support that we provide for people who are victims of uh, of pseudo images of of, uh, of, of deep fakes, as, as you can kind of see. So that is what the helpline has been dealing with uh, over the course um, of the last uh, the last six years. Just wanted to highlight a particular case. Um, now, this is one that we've very much been working on in partnership with the National Crime Agency in the UK. And it's actually to do with one particular perpetrator um, who, uh, as you can see um, uh, on, uh, on some of these uh, media articles, uh, in, in actual fact, his sentencing is happening right now. Um, this afternoon, um, uh, he, was, uh, he was found guilty um, earlier, uh, two months ago, and his sentencing is this afternoon. It is, um, as an offender, so the National Crime Agency in the UK, the, 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 the UK-wide um, law enforcement uh, agency, um, it is, uh, as an individual, it, it is the most amount of offences that the National Crime Agency has ever brought to bear on an individual. And it is to do, in this case, with both um, non-consensual intimate image abuse uh, and also child sexual abuse uh, as well. Um, uh, you can see down the bottom, uh, so we have been supporting 136 victims uh, that we found. We suspect there are a lot more, but those are the specific victims in this particular case that we've been supporting. And from this case alone, uh, we've had uh, 123,000 in individual images that the individual has shared online that we've had removed. There are clearly, as you can see, there's 9,000 that we've not been able to remove. 
uh, for a, for a host of a host of different reasons, typically beyond jurisdiction. But certainly, that's an enormous amount of images. Um, and, and there's a lot of pride that we're able to bring closure in of at least those 123,000 images. So a significant case uh, and one that really showcases the, the power, I think, uh, of what is this particular helpline and support, particularly for, for, for victims. I did just want to quickly um, focus um, on um, the impact that COVID had on us. Um, so what these graphs uh, illustrate um, on, on the left hand side there is the number of uh, cases that the helpline has supported. Um, and you can see, so in 2020, uh, we saw about a doubling of caseload um, that, uh, that the helpline received. Uh, and because we saw a lot of extortion, because people were clearly migrating online, we think that situations have very much been aggravated by lockdown or uh, pandemic, uh, the, uh, the imposition of, uh, of lockdown, uh, pandemic lockdown uh, restrictions. Um, the graph on the right hand side is just the, the number of images that we've been able to remove. So um, in, uh, in 2019, we removed about 25,000 images. And then in 2020, uh, we, we removed 132,000 images. I should add as well, that's not including the 123,000 that we removed uh, in 2021. So we saw a five-fold increase last year in the removal rate of, of specifically non-consensual intimate image uh, abuse. And, and it, is, it is a fair thing to say um, that uh, re in, in removal of images, so by, by, by law, the content is not illegal. Uh, certainly from a UK law, the content is not illegal. It's more the consent um, or it's the, uh, it's, it's the lack of consent in posting it that's actually the, uh, lack, uh, that's the, the, the offence. And so the removal of, uh, of content is very much done in partnership with, uh, with platforms. And again, I'm sure Karuna is going to explain that a little bit later on. I can, can contribute a little bit later on. I'm setting Karuna up for lots of things to contribute to, aren't I? Um, uh, th obviously, the, the, the graph's in the middle. Um, uh, th these are graphs uh, in terms of data that really articulate why I am sitting here. Um, uh, and it all to do with the massive gender imbalance that the helpline supports. So 84%, as you can see, 84% of the cases that we deal with uh, have both a, a male perpetrator and a female victim. Uh, and, and that is, is evidence alone, I think, to, um, to, to make this particular point uh, and some of the points that Maria made uh, earlier on as well. And you can see the graph at the top there in terms of just the, the gender of, of those victims um, that we receive at, at the helpline as well. Again, just to make this particular point, this is um, our tracker in terms of monthly caseload that the helpline deals with. And the, the yellow box there, you can essentially see, um, is when uh, we, we saw COVID, uh, COVID restrictions. Now, the red line uh, in March 2020 was our predicted caseload looking forwards. Um, and you can kind of see there's sort of a linear growth. You can understand, you can understand that continual growth. But uh, the, the blue line is the actual caseload that we received. So uh, I, I should report too. So 2021, we, we've it surpassed the whole number of 2020 cases in September. So we continue to see this uh, very much this rise uh, in, in caseload and the support for victims um, uh, as, as well. So um, it is, it is a, a huge issue that, um, that, that we are dealing with uh, and the helpline uh, and the team indeed in, uh, are dealing with as well. Uh, and, and so that's what I suppose what I wanted to really just um, add into this uh, th this conversation in terms of whether that's numbers, whether that's evidence, uh, but, but fundamentally um, the sorts of uh, issues uh, and the, also to articulate some of the distress that comes along with this. So 4% of all those who, um, who we, we receive calls from um, within the helpline have had some form of suicidal, ide suicidal ideation. 38% have got some form of mental um, mental well-being and mental health issues associated with the case and the situation that they, they find themselves in as well. So that's what I wanted to articulate. Um, uh, and, you know, some of the things that there are things that, that victims, can, victims can do in this particular case uh, as well, not necessarily to make the situation go away, but certainly to, to ease. And we have a we certainly have a part to play in, in that in that role as well. So, Deborah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your intervention. And um, we'll uh, leave time for the questions after the also um, having the other sp speakers um, uh, on our panel. And now I would like to introduce um, Ms. Karuna Nain. 
She's the director of the Global Safety Policy at Meta, based in Menlo Park, California, where she's responsible for working on issues of child online safety and well-being, women's safety and suicide prevention. In her past eight years at Meta, Karuna developed Meta Safety Center, led the global expansion of the company's suicide prevention resources, and the pilot program for victims to proactively report non-consensually uh, shared intimate images. Karuna serves on the board of the National Network to End Domestic Violence and is on the Family Online Safety Institute's member group. Karuna, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, David, for having me here. Uh, first off, I'm really sorry I can't be there in person and I'm doing this virtually. I think um, I would have loved to be there on the ground doing this to get a chance to meet most of you all in person. Uh, but, you know, what can we do? Hopefully next year things look different and David will invite me for another panel and we'll be there in person uh, meeting and talking, you know, it takes away some of the joy. But again, thank you for having me. Um, what I wanted to do is really talk about, you know, our approach to keeping women safe on our platforms. I know there have been some questions already coming in via the chat feature. Um, and I know that uh, the MEP also referenced some of the work that tech companies should be doing. So I wanted to just give a quick overview of how we approach this issue as a technology company. But before, you know, I do that, I just wanted to highlight, you know, the past couple of years have been unprecedented for us around the world. Uh, when COVID was first detected, many countries went into lockdown and we saw how important technology, mobile phones, internet became in each and every one of our lives to stay connected with the things that we care about, to have incomes, to be able to work remotely. So the, the importance of technology and internet has always been there, but it has been even more highlighted in the past couple of years, you know, be it for actually earning your income or be it for having social interaction, it, the role of technology has been fundamental. Uh, the 2021 report released by GSMA on the mobile gender gap has some really important data we all should need to keep in mind. Women's access to mobile internet continues to increase, which is great. I think there were around 112 million additional female users getting online in 2020. However, there's still 20, 234 million fewer women than men accessing the internet. The gender gap remains substantial. Women are 7% less likely than men to own a mobile phone and 15% less likely to use mobile internet. This is statistics as of 2020. I'd be interested to see when their next report comes out, how the pandemic has really shaped these numbers and whether women tended to get more online during this time or you know, how did this change during this past year? But we all know that you know, technology has come to a whole new, I think elevation or a whole new uh, level of importance for all of us in the past couple of years. And there's never been a more urgent time to address the issue. So I'm really grateful that you all are convening this panel to talk about mending the gender gap, not just minding the gender gap. At Meta, we've always had recognition that we are we play a fundamental role in making sure that our platforms are safe for women. Women feel that they can come here, they can engage, they can connect with their friends, family, things that they care deeply about. And when we think about keeping women safe on our platform, we tend to take a four point approach. It starts with building partnerships, organizations such as the one that David runs on the ground in the UK, people who are on the front lines hearing directly from women on how we could be doing more, how we could strengthen our policies, how can we build products that really cater to the needs of women. Then, you know, based on a lot of that feedback, we develop policies that very clearly state what people can and cannot share on our platforms. So David talked about the work that we've been doing jointly on combating the non-consensual sharing of intimate images on our platform. So when it comes to this issue, for example, our policies state that not only can you not share such content on Meta's platforms, but also threats to share this kind of content would violate our policies. The third pillar on this work is making sure that we have tools and technology that really, one, empower people, give people the control to really define their experiences on our platform, but also technology that we can run at the back end to proactively get ahead of harmful content so that people aren't impacted negatively by that content beyond 
you know, what is absolutely bare minimum. So I'll give you an example. Again, in the area of non-consensually shared intimate images, we are able to run proactive detection capabilities to see if someone has shared this content to us on our platforms and proactively send it to our review teams to check what's going on. And then the third pillar of this is resources, making sure that we are able to connect people with resources, not just you know, having our safety centers and our uh, guides that we develop with experts, but also within the product itself. So very recently, for example, we started surfacing an alert to people on Messenger when we had data or when we had an indication that some interaction may actually be making them uncomfortable. And we started giving them a reminder at that point that would you like to report this conversation or would you like to block the person who initiated this conversation to give them that kind of resource in line in that moment rather than expecting them to remember something which ordinarily people you know when you're not in when you're just not normally using our platforms you would not need those tools you would not be thinking about these form of this form of safety and then last but not least is making sure that we are constantly absorbing feedback from the way that our community uses our surfaces and making sure that we are updating our platforms appropriately I want to double down on an initiative that David briefly mentioned, stopncii.org. This system is something which is really innovative. It's something that we hasn't been ever tested out before this. What it really seeks to do is give people control. Even before your intimate images have been shared online, can you proactively reach out to companies and give them a heads up that, look, I have an intimate image or video I'm worried that this may be shared on your platforms. Can you keep a lookout for it? And if it violates your policies, can you kick into high gear and make sure that it doesn't get shared on your platforms? So we built this service all thanks to David and his team, incredible team at UK Revenge Porn Helpline. It's been a labor of love, lots of work that has gone in for over two years, I think, if David can keep me honest here. But the way that it works is it's very victim centric. You come to a website, and you get some basic information about what is a non-consensually shared intimate image, um, how, you know, who are the organizations who work in this space, you get some resources to help you out. We try and make sure that, you know, we reduce some of the burden that you're feeling at that time because there's so much guilt, there's so much shame that is associated with this harm. We try and give you some resources to help you manage that. And then we give you an option to start a case. When you click on the start a case option, we ask you some questions to just make sure that this service actually works for you and will be able to help you out. So this service is meant for adults, for example. Minors, unfortunately, because the kind of content is illegal imagery, need to be redirected to other organizations. Uh, so when people answer those basic qualifier questions, they can actually select the photos and videos directly from their device the photos and videos never leave their device. So it's very privacy by design. It's very safe by design. Only the hashes are shared back with stopncii.org, which is run by David's incredible organization. And then those are shared back with participating companies. When participating companies receive those hashes and they find matching content on their platforms, they're able to review the matching content to determine if it violates their policies or not and quickly take action on it if it violates their policies. So again, really keeping in mind what is the need of victims at that point, making sure that they have privacy by design, security, and safety, because none of their information is shared back with stopncii.org at any point. The only thing that is shared back is hashes. And the goal is to really give them some control in an incredibly hard situation. They can come back, check the status of their case, has any participating country found, company found matching content which they have been able to successfully block because they had the hash. So again, giving victims control. We've just launched it with Facebook and Instagram, but our hope is that other participating companies will join um, in the days, weeks, and months to come. And I think this is really one of a great example of a global platform that you know people can go to. You don't have to go to each and every tech company one by one when you are in that horrible situation to report content to get help. You can come to this one centralized place to get that kind of support. Uh, I could go on and on, but I think this is just one step and there's so much more work that we have to do here. We are definitely committed to making sure that we can uh, respond to the needs of people around the world. Uh, we, you know, but there is there's definite interest and there's definite uh, steps that are being taken in the right direction. 
I'm going to stop because I know other panelists have to speak as well, and I'm happy to take any questions that people may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karuna, for your intervention. Um, and now we'll pass on to another panelist, who's Juliana Cuna from Brazil. She's a psychologist with a master's degree in culture and society. Juliana has more than a decade experience on tech and human beings. At SaferNet Brazil, she's special projects director, focusing on youth empowerment and online safety, especially women and vulnerable people. She's also responsible for the Brazilian National Helpline for Online Safety, offering one-to-one -one conversations about privacy, sextortion, cyberbullying, freedom of speech, and other human rights-related issues. In this regard, she also develops educational material, speeches, and campaigns to raise awareness about digital citizenship to Bra in Brazil. Welcome, um, Juliana. The floor is yours. Thank you, Deborah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank you the opportunity to share my work at CIFRANET Brazil. And I'm just uh, share my screen because I'm going to show my presentation. Uh, just to brief present the, uh, who is CIFRANET and what you do. Uh, CIFRANET is an NGO. Uh, that defends human rights on internet for 15 years. And you work as a safer internet center in Brazil uh, and uh, have actions in three different fronts of online protection. First of all, we're responsible for the uh, Brazilian National uh, Cybercrime Reporting Center, uh, receiving reports uh, again, uh, of contents against human rights on the internet. Uh, and we do that in partnership, in cooperation with authorities in, in justice department. And we also run a national helpline, uh, web-based helpline uh, that offers one-to-one -one conversation about uh, human rights viol violations, extortion, cyberstalking, uh, and other uh, related issues, uh, especially focused on young people and vulnerable groups like women. And besides that, we also run the country's awareness nodes, and we are responsible for education activities uh, such as workshops with uh, educators and uh, young people developing materials and carry out the campaigns. And we are part of three different uh, global networks. Uh, one, the first is the Hope. It's a global network of uh, uh, hotlines, more than 40, 40 uh, 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 hotlines around the world. In SAFE, that is mentioned, we coordinate the Safer Internet Day in Brazil since 2009. And the Child Helpline International, that is a network of helplines that have more than 100 uh, members in the world. And uh, we, uh, I can show you just a piece of uh, uh, indicators related to reports received by our hotline. So we received more than 4 uh, million, 2,090. Uh, 109,000 uh, 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 reports, and uh, you can see all these uh, related uh, indicators, such as the where, which page, what, what kind of page, and what was removed, uh, what were removed. So it's important to understand that, uh, uh, of course, the, we have different types of content that can be reported, such as racism or content involving sexual violence against children, or even misogyny and LGBT phobia. So you can see uh, in the SaferNet web page to, uh, to know, understand better these indicators. I just want to show the increase of the reports during the first year of the pandemic, 2020. And you can notice, for example, that uh, hate, speech, hate speech against women increases 70, 80 uh, percent 
in last year. So it's an important issue. To, of course, uh, in the pandemic, we noticed an increase in all the kinds of type uh, report content types reported to SaferNet. But it's important to highlight this, this specific type of content. So as I mentioned, you can find more in this uh, page. And I'd like to present uh, specifically what we do uh, to address uh, violations uh, against women on the internet, especially the victims that we supported and help at our helpline. So we offer a uh, one-to-one -one conversation uh, through chat or by mail. Uh, and the talk is, is around the extortion, uh, uh, suspicion of online grooming, or no consensual share of intimate images and other human rights related issues, as I mentioned. And during the uh, for during these uh, 14 years, we helped more than 30,000, 30, uh, 32,000 uh, victims from different uh, parts of the uh, the country. And uh, in last year, we noticed that uh, well-being and mental health is the first in the uh, five e in the top five of the top kids, uh, that victims uh, get for help. And we understand that the pandemic it, it's like, it worked like a trigger for many people that are suffering with anxiety, depression, and other uh, uh, issues related to well-being. But if you, the most uh, reported violations uh, uh, from victims is non-consensual share of intimate images. Of course, uh, it is, uh, you can see that it's an increasing, but in 2018, I can highlight that we have a huge campaign, a national uh, awareness campaign. So of course, uh, you have more people uh, asking us, seeking us for help, but uh, it's, a, it's a big issue in, in our helpline. Uh, and you can notice that uh, uh, no consensual sharing, it's a, a violation that affects specifically in a more, most proportionality uh, women than, uh, than men and boys. So you can see in the graphic, and we know why, because we have a culture that's blaming, uh, especially girls and women, and uh, that uh, uh, have some of prejudice or discrimination against a women or girl that have your nudity sherry without consent. So uh, the impact is worse for girls and women. And uh, uh, you can see, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Karuna told, but I think I, it's important to highlight that during these last years, we noticed a, a huge advance uh, in, in technologies, especially technologies that use it to, to address the situation uh, of violence against a uh, child, is, uh, child exploitation, but it's uh, used now to detect uh, no consensual sharing, even the extortion when you threat someone to share uh, a nude or semi-nude image. So it's important to highlight that uh, technology is an important ally to fight against the kind of uh, violence. And legislation in Brazil, we have some change and it's important to understand how you can recognize and, and uh, describe it better what kind of, uh, what types of online violence. So you have uh, different uh, changes, for example, uh, a change just to recognize no concession sharing or other to cyber stalking and even to misogyny, uh, hate speech against women in the last years in Brazil. And it's a huge advance. But of course, you will have challenges uh, to address uh, more, um, uh, uh, to address the inequality in the impact of technology. And uh, one thing that I, I want to, uh, of course, there are many recommendations, I list some. But uh, one thing that I want to to address to highlight is that the 
we have to change the way of gender-based violence is perceived by people involved, especially victims, survivors, bystanders. So we have to establish a non-panic basic approach to respond more appropriately to, to this uh, problem. And I think that some of the strategies that I list, it's important to, to reach this goal, to how to, to have a, a non-panic approach, uh, especially because uh, if you think about it, sexuality, even uh, uh, between teenagers, it's a huge and uh, 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 issue that even schools or family don't have any idea how to talk about how, and there is a, a kind of polarization about this kind of uh, uh, debate, especially in education, in curriculum, in, in, in Brazilian schools. So we have to develop a new strategy to address the neutralization of the gender-based violence uh, beyond the criminalization approach. And I ha we have to enable uh, critical appropriation of technology based on women's uh, right approach. And this threatening, especially this is very important, threatening peer support network, because some uh, in the majority of the cases, one victim, one girl uh, uh, asking for help for a friend, not a, an adult. So how to threaten a peer support network for girls who are victims of online gender-based violence. And of course, the training actors from protection system to ensure the provision of services that are aligned to gender equality principles. And I think it's uh, my part of the discussion is that. So thank you very much for, uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion and all the, uh, the debate with the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you for your intervention. And now we go to our last panelist, who is the youngest panelist. <laughs> She's Marina Kobidaki from the Youth Panel, from the Greek Youth Panel. She's 17 years, and she has been a member of the Greek Youth Panel for a number of years, actively supporting the activities of the Greek Safer Internet Center. She helped also with the creation of videos addre addressing a variety of issues like cyberbullying and the right to report, and she has participated in the activities of the European BEC Youth Panel. Maria, Marina. Thank you so much. Um, as uh, we mentioned, I am Marina. I'm 17 years old and I've been an active member of the Safer Internet Greek Youth Panel for about four years now. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone for their contribution today. Everything was very interesting and important. Uh, I want to say that I'm very glad to be given this chance and opportunity to share my thoughts on the matter that we're touching on today, which is, of course, um, online violence and more specifically the apparent gender gap that exists. Um, Today I want to try and share my perspective and experience on that matter as a teenager as a teenager and more specifically a teenage girl living on a country that I think is pretty heavily influenced by that gender gap. I live in Greece. Um, this observation is of course derived from also from a research that was performed last year by the Safer Internet Center in my country that showed that uh, out of the 10 to 18 year olds asked, uh, most of them had already experienced online harassment and the grand majority of them were actually female. They were young girls. Um, but in order not to stall, I think what actually has to be done to cope with this issue is to target straight to the society's core values. Uh, what I'm trying to say that's from my experience, um, when I am, uh, when we're trying to talk to people my age, like 16 to 18 year olds that have already kind of formed and shaped their online identities, it's not impossible, but harder to change their mentality. 
That's why I think that digital, digital literacy and education has to be offered from a very young age. Um, before children are exposed to the online world on their own, and even before they have uh, completely formed their both their online and offline mentality. Um, w because uh, in order to really incor uh, incorporate, incorporate these actions to their lifestyle, they should really adopt, ado adopt and assimilate them. Um, in my opinion, that can only be done uh, if uh, this education is also provided by the school curriculum, as I think Mrs. Maria previously mentioned. Um, this is because I think, uh, from my experience, what, uh, school is what actually has shaped me and still does. Um, that's why I think that the safer internet centers, um, they should work together with the Ministry of Education uh, in every case um, and offer this digital literacy both to straight to students but to teachers, to my teachers as well because I think what's very important and I want to highlight here is that this education should not only be offered once or once a year, but it should be something consistent, repetitive, and continuous. And if the teachers are in a place to provide this information to their students by utilizing some material that we can give them, that's the only way this consistency can be achieved. Um, of course, this education that we can offer and the digital literacy will be focused on shaping their mentalities and online actions in the future, but it should also be about what online harassment is and how children can recognize it when they experience it or they see someone else experience it and actually report that and not underestimate it and give the enough attention and the appropriate, appropriate attention that it actually deserves. Um, also, I another thing that maybe we should touch on is that we should cope with the remnants of uh, the patriarchal perceptions that our societies maybe still hold, in my country at least, uh, because it's something that actually prevents us from, my, uh, for, from mending this gender gap. So thank you so much for your attention. And at this point, I want to especially thank uh, David, Karuna, Maria, Juliana, who are fighting for my and my friends and every girls in the world and women's better life online life and thank you so much for that thank you thank you thank you marina so now we'll go on to see if there are any questions from the online and offline guests okay i have some more. Um, thank you for your presentations uh, on the one hand it's uneasy to hear how much progress we still have to make but surely we should mend the gender gap i agree with that uh, but i have Two questions, maybe the first of them is quick. When we're mending the, mending the gender gap, are we mending the gender gap between just two genders? What is the place of non-binary approaches in that field? Because it's definitely possible to imagine that trans women would be attacked because uh, you know, in the eyes of some people, they're not womanly enough. And even trans men can be attacked for preserving some womanly characteristics. But uh, those groups are not easily incorporated into women-specific like modes of protection. And my second question is perhaps to Meta representative. Um, we were talking about protection against revenge porn. But sometimes um, the expression of womanhood uh, let's say on social media, like Instagram, includes an element of nudity, like sometimes art that includes that element, and it actually, I think, normalizes women's body and women's sexuality, is censored by Instagram, for instance. The whole Free the Nipple campaign was, I think, very noticeable, and the result of it is really kind of censoring the artists who want to normalize women's body and make it less of a taboo in the society. So I wonder, 
how we can preserve that balance between self-expression, perhaps in explicit ways if that's necessary, and art, and uh, um, you know, protection of women. I, I don't know if Karuna wants to take the second question. I, I've got a response. Uh, meanwhile, I've got a response to the first one. I know. So certainly, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm approached. I'm sure I'm talking on behalf of all helplines who support the sorts of victims that we support. Um, it, it, uh, we we do support men as as well as women. Um, I, I know. I think we stand for victims. So anyone who's had their their images shared or threatened to have their images shared without consent who's a victim in that case, that's who we stand for and we stand by. Um, it's just the reason we're kind of talking about this here is because of the extreme uh, nature of the, the data and, the, and, the, and in that case, the gender that we support. Um, that's, we're driven by the, the victim, the victimization of it rather than necessarily by, by the gender, but just sharing kind of where we are with, with the data. Karuna, I don't know whether you had the second part of the question. Yeah, absolutely, David. And also just to add on to your first uh, response, I think we all know that something like non-consensually shared intimate image abuse is also felt very strongly by, you know, the communities which you talked about, by the LGBTQ communities. So uh, there is definitely the tools and the policies that we are creating also apply to them. Uh, and we are very cognizant of the fact that there are groups that may be targeted just because of, you know, their sexual orientation or their gender. And we want to make sure that we have protections in place uh, to enable them to be able to use platforms such as ours, ours for expression, for connection. And our platforms are in increasingly important for their safety as well. Um, on the second question, I think you've raised a really, really important point, and this is something that you know my team and I think of a lot, and it keeps us awake at night. When you are have a platform like ours, which is so global in terms of its reach, in terms of its usage, what, how, where should our policies lie, and how should we be thinking about, you know, making sure that we are really responding to the global needs of our community. And the way that we try and really design our policies is make sure that we're in constant consultation with experts. So nudity is a really interesting question. And you know, uh, if you talk to people from the country where I am from, which is India, uh, you know, a lot of policymakers, regulators, people will turn around and tell me, my God, there's so much nudity on your platforms. You really need to be cracking down more. You need to take down more content, which is, you know, sexually explicit or nude or, you know, uh, this thing, because it's, it's not in line with, you know, what our expectations are from your service. And then when you go down to my colleagues who are in the Nordics or, you know, other parts of the world, they'll be the first ones to say, you guys are prudes. This is self-expression. This is, you know, um, you are actually adding to uh, stigmatizing some of these issues by take, having such stringent policies and taking it down. So we have, you know, our policies are never going to be in a place where I can turn around and tell you, this is where the policy is, it's never going to change. Our policies continuously evolve in response to the global community and shifting norms and changing conversations. When I joined Meta, our nudity policies were pretty stringent. We wouldn't allow pictures of breasts at all. But then over the years in consultation with women's rights groups, experts, advocates, we've actually made some carve outs, we've actually made some shifts. We don't allow complete nudity just because we have minors on our platform and we want to respond to the global needs of our community. But we do allow, you know, photographs of women's breasts if they are shared in the context of uh, a protest, for example, or if they are shared in, you know, if post-surgery you want to share your scars and talk about your recovery or your experiences. Or if you know you want to share pictures of breastfeeding, we do allow that kind of content now, which we didn't six years back on our platform. So uh, um, what I'm essentially trying to you know say is like I hear you. This is a discussion which we're having continuously. Where should the line on some of these really complicated issues you know be drawn? And this is something we want to have in consultation with experts, people who are around the world, you know, thinking about these issues, and we're responding to the needs of our global community. Uh, but thank you for the question. It's something which we are constantly evaluating and making sure we're in the right place on. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from? Hello, my name is Valerie from Germany. Um, first of all, thank you for all the panelists' um, very important work and research. Um, to my questions, which would be directed to Karuna for Meta, um, thinking about the age limit for registering to, for example, Instagram, which I think is at 13 years old at the moment, 
and um, also about my pre-speaker who mentioned, okay, how can we allow more artistic nudity? I was actually more thinking about how can we protect those minors that are on the on the platform and that might even be younger because it is um, difficult to really control at what age they register. How can we protect those minors to get into the mindset of seeing a lot of nudity and maybe um, uploading um, yeah, difficult images themselves and getting into that expectation of, okay, I need to be sexual, which I think, especially in Instagram, where you see a lot of um, perfect, um, beautiful um, women, men as well, of course. Um, yes, so <laughs> bottom line, what is uh, Meta's approach to also protecting kind of the mindset of minors through the pictures that they see on a constant basis? Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Again, something which you know my teams are constantly thinking about. How do we make sure that our platforms actually foster well-being and don't really add to all the trauma and the anguish which you know young women have when they're growing up? It's hard enough to grow up like you know in an offline world, and then you compound it with having like these online worlds where you are, uh, you know, where you are at risk of you know be. A feeling a lot more of those pressures being um, aggravated. So we do partner with, again, experts in this space to constantly think about where our policy should be, what kind of content should we allow, what kind of content should we not allow. And we also make sure that we're working with them to provide resources. So for example, you know, one of the things we've been doing is working with the National Eating Disorder Association uh, to just think about, is there other resources that we could provide you if you are searching for some of this content on our platforms to make you just give you some uh, tips, some resources to help you manage any of this, you know, these discussions which you're having with yourself or any of this crisis that you may be facing. So that's the kind of work which we want to do over here. And again, we, you know, our same four point approach that I talked about, we make sure that we are partnering with experts on the ground. We are building, you know, policies that really are keeping in mind some of these situations that people may be in. We don't want to stigmatize some of these, you know, issues, and we don't want to add to, you know, the burden and the shame. But we do want to provide resources and make sure that, you know, you are empowered to make the right choices on our platforms. But also making sure that, you know, we have um, tools that help you define your experience. So, for example. You know, we have a tool that really tells you how much time you're spending on our platforms and what is it that you're doing to help you get more control on the time that you are really spending on our platforms. So in a nutshell, again, the same four point approach applies. But this is, again, an area where we are doing a lot of work and we are keen to invest more in the days and weeks to come. Thank you. Thank you, Karuna. Um, Evangelia, I don't know if there are any questions from yes. the online. Yes. yes, we have uh, okay. two questions, and there was a hand raised, but I can't see it right now. Well, I will go on with the question. So, the first question is, comes from Mark, and uh, he asks, what are the tools set in place to combat gender-based style violence online at a global space? So, we have heard uh, Karuna talk about this uh, a uh, platform uh, about uh, who, which offers proactive actions and victim-centric victim approach. What are the other tools that exist right now to combat gender violence online? Can I, I, if I'll, I'll take that in terms of a, a response. Um, one of the things as part of the work that uh, Stop NCII um, has, has involved uh, has been um, the discovery, uh, I, I think, of, uh, of this network of, of, of helplines, um, or helplines or indeed support services. Uh, and, and so not only is there this particular platform in this particular case for this particular um, uh, issue, but it is the, the contextual, the, the support that is also available in various different countries, which I think has, has also been a, a, a really helpful thing. So I, I'm not sure, Member Gaila, that actually specifically answers the question about um, uh, what tools are available, although that clearly I, is, is a tool, think, but um, it's I, the network of support, I think. Uh, yes, I think uh, that is a great answer because uh, we in InSafe have... Uh, 32 awareness centers in Europe and uh, uh, around 40 uh, hotlines in uh, uh, worldwide. So this uh, this actually is 
an answer to what tools and exist. There are not tools, of course, but of course, they help people to combat this issue. We, and another question, yes, we, please, we, please. We should probably also mention Safe Internet Day again, um, which is always an, a, a, an opportunity to, to mark uh, anything to do with being safer online, which I think I mentioned it earlier on, but I'll mention it again, uh, which is on the February the 8th next year. It's marked in some 190 countries across the world, and, and that is predominantly the reason that, that we're here um, as well. You can kind of see the, the, the small advert behind Evangelia's head. So if I haven't mentioned it already, it's on the 8th of February uh, next year. Put a date in your calendars. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. And another question we have from Lourdes, uh, who is a journalist and a digital security trainer from Kenya. So uh, the question is, do you plan to expand your support beyond UK, David? <laughs> this question is for you. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, so um, Stop NCI is available globally. Um, uh, so that, that very much answers that, that question. It's, it's available for anyone um, to, to be able to hash their own images and to upload it onto, in this particular case, as Karuna said, onto Facebook and to Instagram uh, to prevent those images from being uploaded or indeed identify those, those images. So yes, it's available globally. And what we've tried to do as well is provide and signpost to um, uh, some 50 other national support centers uh, and, uh, that will provide you one more national support because we, we are just a relatively small team uh, and it's a bit daunting taking on uh, all of that for the world. So um, hence, that there, there's a, as, as Julianne has always pointed out, some of the support, for example, in, in Brazil, there's, there's a network of some amazing support centers and that's what hopefully uh, is, is signposted inside uh, Stop NCI uh, as well. Thank you, David. Yeah, we have another question from the on-site guests. Yes, just a quick follow-up on the NCI. Yes, uh, I, we know that it's operated globally, but is there investment in uh, popularizing it and creating awareness? Because it's one thing to have the support system, but if the user don't know about the support system, and I, for example, I'm active digital citizen, but not necessarily that I know all the support that is available, and especially uh, for those who are not active users, and most of them, they're the ones who are victims. So how do we make sure that this support, the information and the tool is mainstreamed, that everyone know that there is the support that is, uh, I can get? Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure, Karuna, whether you may well have a, 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 res a response to. I, all I was going to add, to, uh, to, to just to start with, was you know in partnership with these 50, um, 50 partners from across the world, um, so they've not only are able to support people, but you know it provides them with the ability to support their the victims that they do as well. So their their role in promoting it and signposting it to to as as a as a solution. So sorry, Karuna. No, absolutely, David. I think that's the first line of uh, you know entry that we have. There are these incredible organizations around the world who are already working with people who are in these horrific situations, and they are the first line of response. They're the first people you'd reach out to if you were in this situation, making sure they know about the tool and that they have actually given feedback. People like Juliana, who really are working with people in these horrible situations, that's the first way you'd get to know about this resource. We just launched it, I think, a week back. So uh, we're just getting started in terms of, you know, raising the awareness about it. But, you know, right at the time of launch, also we did some announcements. We put out some, you know, blog posts. We we anticipate some people may be searching online for this resource and will stumble upon it. But you wouldn't really use it if you didn't look at an organization from your own country in the list of partners that support it. Because you'd be like, is this really a real, you know, service? Am I going to, you know, send my photos and videos? They're saying they're not going to take them, but is this really real? So having that net network of partners around the world is going to be critical for its adoption. And then I think the second thing is even each and every participating company has a role they can play in upselling this, making people know that this exists when they are in that time of need. I think having general awareness about safety features, safety tools is good. But when I'm really in the moment need that kind of help and support, can you know, platform find a way of surfacing it to me so that I actually end up using it, that's going to be, again, critical for its adoption. So, for example, when someone reports 
content to us as Meta, saying that this is a non-consensually shared intimate image of mine. At that point, can we tell them that this service exists, stop ncii.org exists, or in our safety centers, or when people are just you know reading up information on our health centers, can they come across this platform at that point? That's going to be the second line of entry for people who are looking for this form of help and support. And then last but not least is friends and family. You know, when you're in trouble, you reach out to someone who you really trust to get guidance, to get advice. So the more that we can get the word out there, like, you know, people know that this service exists, they are more likely to refer a friend who's in that horrible situation to this platform. So the, that's the way that we mentally tend to think about it. The three, you know, entry points will be just a general Google search. I'm looking for help and support. You stumble on this website or you stumble on any of our, one of our incredible partners who tell you that this system exists. You then also reach out to one of the incredible partners who's counseling you in the course of the counseling. You tell them that you have intimate images. You're worried they'll be used without your consent online. They haven't already been shared and they tell you about the service. And last but not least, the tech companies through their reporting flows, through their safety centers, help centers, can they upsell this uh, service to you at that point as well? Thank you, thank you very much for the clear explanation. Um, okay, so I think <laughs> we were supposed to have some breakout rooms, but I think we have, we had some very important questions to deal with and I think Make our disc that made our discussion very interesting. So I'd like to thank you all. Unless there are any questions that uh, someone would like to to pose, we have a question. Yes, Boris. Hello, everybody, and thank you. This should have been a question, for, but uh, I would like to ask the panel. There are regional, national different differences. So what are they? in the challenges that affect and impact gender and genders online. We have to understand that there are some local uh, differences, as Karuna said, especially for the uh, question of nudity. So on the question that impacts gender online, what are those differences in different parts of the world? Thank you. Um, yep, I can, I can take that. We've got, look at that, it's gone red, three minutes left. Um, uh, so again, again, as part of, of part of this project, that is, that is a, that's a really important question, um, and uh, it, it was it, it was a lot of time and a lot of a lot of energy in, um, w which we applied into the title. Uh, so, what is the correct title for this, uh, which we arrived at, at non-consensual intimate image abuse? Uh, in some countries, it's referred to as non-consensual sexual uh, image, uh, and we arrived at intimate images for exactly that that particular reason that intimacy better describes, I think we concluded, better describes the, um, the respect to various different cultures and countries and situations. Um, uh, and, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have, an image doesn't necessarily have to be sexual for it to still be, uh, have significant uh, impact and, and harm. Um, and so that's why we very much arrived at the, the, the word related to intimacy rather than necessarily what would would apply probably more more appropriately to to platforms terms and conditions, which will be around sexual nudity and sexual images. But that's hence we arrived at intimacy. One minute left. Yeah. Okay. So well, thank you, thank you all for your um, participation and for your interesting questions, and thank you for being present here. And we we'll wish you all a good evening. Mm -hmm.